Perfect. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're well. It's Rabbi Akiva Males, and today is Wednesday. It's the 31st of May, last day of May. And we're going to look at some Divrei Torah and Parshas Nasso that we're getting ready for. Uh, today, I'm actually not at home. I'm in the school in the Margolin Hebrew Academy, and that's because I have to be a school. I have to be at a school-related program at about two thirty-five. So today we're going to end a little bit earlier than usual, but that'll still give us plenty of time to look at some incredible sources for this week. So in Parshas Nasso that we're going to read this Shabbos here in Chutzlaritz in in Eretz Yisrael, they already read Nasso last week because it was not Shavuos for them. Shavuos for us here in, in the outside of Israel, but in Israel, it was not Shavuos last Shabbos. It was Parshas Naso. So they're now one week ahead of us. They're going to read Bahaloscha this week. So we're going to, it's going to take us a little bit till we catch up again when there's a double Parsha. So in the meantime, we in Chutz Lawrence are reading Parshas Naso, and there are many topics that come up. I want to focus today on Birchas Kohanim, on the special blessings that the Kohanim uh, share with us. And uh, they are written down in this week's Parsha. So let's see what they say. The Pasuk says it's at the end of Perak Vav. By Daber Hashem Moshe God spoke to Moshe saying, Daber Aaron Vel Banav, I want you to speak to Aaron and to his sons. Lemur, and this is what I want you to tell them. Yisrael. This is how you're supposed to bless the children of Israel. And Morlahem, this is what you should say to them. And here it is. Yivarechecha Hashem v'yishmerecha that Hashem should bless you and watch over you. May the Lord cause his countenance to shine on you and favor you. May the Lord rise, raise his countenance towards you and grant you peace. And then the Pasuk, the Parak rather, concludes by saying, Your job is Kohanim, is to place my name upon B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, so that I, meaning God, will bless them. So the Kohanim are going to be the conduits of God's blessing to B'nai Yisrael, and we have the text that they're going to recite. So I want to share with you today a couple of great insights that can be found in the Tosefes Bracha. We've quoted the Tosefes Bracha a number of times over the years. It was written by <coughs> Rabbi Baruch HaLevi Epstein, the same author of the famous Torah Tamima. He also wrote Later in life, he had additional thoughts to write on the Torah, and that's when he wrote his Tosefes Bracha. So we're going to share, he's got some beautiful insights on Birchas Kohanim, and that's what we're going to look at today. So let's look at the first one. I'm on page two. Daber al Aron vel banav lemor kosev archos b'nei Yisrael. So he's going to comment on the Bracha. It's a very interesting Bracha that's different than all the Brachos that we say. Let's look what he writes. He named Mavur Mefurash. This is a this is an obligation on the descendants of Aharon for all generations. Anyone who claims to be a Kohen, what that really means is they're a descendant through their father of Aharon a Kohen. So every Kohen who we see today can claim, or they are claiming that they're a descendant of Aharon. It makes sense to uh, illuminate or to point out Look what the bracha that the Kohanim recite before they bless us. They say, You have sanctified us with the sanctity of Aaron. And now you've commanded us, you've instructed us to bless the Jewish people. So the Torah Tamima, the Baruch HaLevi Epstein asks, Ma nishtana bracha zo mikola brachos? Why is this different than every other bracha that we recite? We just get right, we cut right to the chase. We say, You've sanctified us through your mitzvahs, and you have ordered us, you have instructed us to do X, Y, and Z. Why do we go ahead here by the Kohanim and they say, you've sanctified us with the sanctity of Aharon and now blessed us? That's different than every other bracha. Every other bracha we say, Asher Kiddushanu, you sanctified us the mitzvos of, with your mitzvos and asked us to do X, Y, or Z. Why here is it different? That's his question. So he says, 
every other place we say, you've sanctified us with your mitzvahs. Why here do we say, you know how we're sanctified? Not through your mitzvahs, but rather we're sanctified because you have sanctified Aaron. Why is this different? He says, perhaps we can say as follows. Nowadays, uh, that were so many generations after our own. Who can say with absolute certainty that they are a, a true descendant, ben after ben, son after son after son? Who can say they're absolutely a 100% verified Kohen and that their yichus, their, their heritage is absolutely assured? We've had so many persecutions and wanderings and expulsions, and our yichus, our pedigrees have been uh, shuffled. Who really knows? We've lost whatever books, records that may have been keeping records of everyone's yichus, of everyone's pedigree. They've been lost over our long and bitter galus. When anyone claims that they're a Kohen nowadays, we can't say with absolute certainty they're a Kohen. We don't have the, the ledger that proves this. It's it's it, all said and done. There really is a bit of a doubt. And there's, a, okay, and we'll say, okay, it's established. If that's what they're saying, they're Kohanim, we'll take their word for it. But we can't say with absolute certainty that they're a Kohen. That's why he's saying perhaps Kohanim nowadays after such a long and bitter gullus, they can't say uh, with certainty. When, when we say, Asher mitzvah we're saying, God, you sanctified us with the mitzvahs and asked us to do this. Could we really say that? Could a coin nowadays really say that they've been sanctified by this mitzvah and they have been asked? Who said they're a coin? How do we know? Uh, there's an assumption they are because that's what their dad told them and his dad told them. But how do we really, really know? The ledgers have been lost. So he says, perhaps because of that, after such a long and bitter exile, and this is a mitzvah that's unique to someone who's a male descendant of Aaron. So because the yichos, uh, the pedigrees, are, are not 100% certain and established, maybe that's why the nusach bracha, the, the, the text of the blessing is different. So he says, uh, he continues, L'chein makdim asher so shel Aaron. So we say, you know why we are sanctified? We are sanctified as people who claim to be kohanim nowadays through the sanctity of Aaron. What do we know about Aaron? What was his nature? Tov ayin verodev shalom. He had a good eye. He saw the world in, in with a good eye, not in a jaundiced view, not in a jealous view, but he had a generous eye and he was always pursuing peace. And therefore he gave over as a legacy that we should consider a Kohen, anyone who claims to be a Kohen, even though we're somewhat, uh, suspicious, not suspicious, it's somewhat unproven, even though it's it's hanging in the balance. We can't prove nowadays that anyone is a 100% Kohen. But why do we consider anyone a Kohen? Out of the goodness of Aaron's heart. That's who Aaron was. Aaron had such a tovah, he had such a good eye, and he was so generous, and he was always pursuing peace. We're not going to make an issue out of it. So if someone tells us they're a Kohen, we'll treat them like a Kohen. Uh, again, we're not living at a time of the base of Mikdash where the ramifications or claiming to be a coin are so severe. Right then, you were going to go into the Kodesh section, the sanctified section of the base of Mikdash. There, you know, we wouldn't just do this. There, you need to have Yichus, you need to have pedigree. And when Mashiach arrives and Elio comes, one of the things the Gemara tells us Elio's job is going to be is to clarify all the Yichus, clarify all this pedigree, all of these, uh, all of the family issues that we need to get sorted out. That's one thing that Elio Anavi is going to do. But until that time, someone who claims to be a Kohen, unless we know different, unless we have reason to suspect otherwise, will treat him like a Cohen. That's what we're going to do. Where do we know this from? Because that's Aaron's legacy, that he's a man of peace and he's got a good eye. But he's suggesting that's why their bracha is different. They say, Asher Kiddushanu, why are we sanctified? Because of the holiness of Aaron. That's why we're being treated like a Cohen. However, we can, they can't say he's suggesting, Asher Kiddushanu Sivanu. That that you sanctified with this mitzvah that was given to us and asked us to and to, to bless the people. Who says it was it was given to them? We don't know that for certain. So that's his suggestion. Very interesting. Let's look at his next piece. His next piece is also going on Birchas Kohanim, and it raises another beautiful uh, point. I saw this um, in other sources as well. So we're in the middle of page two. Kosevarchu b'talmim sechas sota. The Gemara tells us in sota. Kosevarchu, when it says this is how you should bless, the Nesias Kapayim, that's talking about with outstretched hands, 
Uvechsuvos, Kosovarchu, the Gemara says in Ksuvos, that what does it mean Kosovarchu? Atem below Zarim. Only people who are part of the family of Kohanim, they're the ones who are supposed to bless, meaning uh, with this formula, when we call up the Kohanim to bless the people, it's the Kohanim who are supposed to do this. When we lived in, in um, Harrisburg, Leila and I used to always smile when this happened. There was one of the other uh, non-Orthodox rabbis in town. There were, there were several other non-Orthodox temples in town. So one of the non-Orthodox rabbis, he was very taken with Berches Kohanim. He loved it. it. It was his most, the part of the Torah he found to be so meaningful. So whenever there would be some type of Jewish communal event and he would speak, he would always end his remarks with Berches Kohanim. One problem, he wasn't a Kohen. But nonetheless, he saw it. That was his role as a rabbi. His role as a rabbi was to bless everyone with Birkas Kohana. Again, I don't know where he got this from, but that was his shtick. And, and it was always, that's what he did whenever there was a communal event. It could have been for the Holocaust. It could have been for Israel. Whatever it was, he would end his remarks if he was asked to speak uh, with the Birkas Kohanim. So here the Gemara is telling us that that's not appropriate. Birkas Kohanim uh, with Nesias Kapayim, with the outstretched hands, that's something that's supposed to be done by the Kohen. Now, all of us, we utter Birkas Kohanim. It's part of our davening every morning with Birkas Shachar. We give it to our kids on Friday nights. We use Birkas Kohanim, but we're not doing it with Nesias Kapayim. We're not outstretching our hands and spreading our fingers the way that the Kohanim do. But this is what this was his shtick. He liked doing this. So let's see what he does now. He says uh, that back in the line, second line, Mishamati Me'ishe Munim Vilna. I heard from a very trustworthy Jew living in Vilna. Shishama Me'aviv Zikeno, who heard from his very elderly father, Mechutani, I'm sorry, Me'aviv Zikeno, from his father, grandfather, Mechutani, he says, was one of my Mechutanim, Hagon Rabbi Cheskel Landau, Roshav based in Bavilna. So this isn't the famous Rabbi Cheskel Landau, who was the note of Yehuda. This was someone later who had served as a, as a rabbi in Vilna. Benifter B'Shnas Tof Reish Lamed Aleph, and he would have passed away this is the late 1800s, when he was 91 years old. On the day of his wedding, meaning uh, uh, this person, when he was, uh, in other words, when his, I guess, an ancestor of his uh, was getting married, he got a bracha from the Vilna Gon. Now, again, that means we're talking about the late 1700s. So this is someone he heard this report from who passed away in the late 1800s, must have heard it from his grandfather, heard from his grandfather, who actually got a bracha from the Vilna Gon on the day of his wedding. He only put one hand on his head when he gave him a bracha. So here it was the day of his wedding. This, this fellow, as a young chassan, as a young groom, he goes to the Vilna Gon for a bracha, and the Vilna Gon just put one hand on his head and he gave him a blessing. It was well known that if the Grod didn't just do anything for the heck of it, if he conducted himself in a certain manner, he was doing it that way because he thought this was the halacha. So they asked him, so I guess his close inner circle saw what he did, that when he came time to give a bracha, he only used one hand. So they asked the Gra, the Vilna Gon, why'd you do it that way? He only put one hand on the fellow's head. And he answers, The only time we find anyone uses two hands for a bracha is Kohanim in the Beis HaMikdash, meaning the Siyas Kapayim, when they would lift their hands and share Birchas Kohanim. The Gemara tells us that only Kohanim are supposed to conduct themselves like Kohanim. And the Vilna Gon was saying, well, one of the aspects of being a Kohen was blessing with two hands. Now, that didn't mean, I, we're going to see what everyone else argued with the Gra on this. So the Gra had a very specific idea that if you're going to bless someone specifically, if you're going to use the words of Yivarech HaShem Yishmarech, use the words of Birchas Kohanim, you can't do it like a coin would. So the go, the go and the Vilna Gon said, that doesn't just mean raising your hands and splitting your fingers the way Kohanim do. He said that even meant using two hands. So now he says, Venira Liba Kavana. So he says, what did the Gon mean? The Ofen Kazeb, Adayim. If you were going to use two hands to bless someone, so the Vilna Gon was machmir, and he said that might fall within the parameters of what the Gemara said, that this is a specific way that the Kohanim are supposed to bless and not others. And he would say that someone who violates this and blesses with two hands are, are going to violate this losase. It appears to me, 
says almost everybody else, nobody else is mocked on this. Outside of the gross circle, nobody else had this, this uh, conduct. And think about all the times we were blessed by our parents as kids on Friday nights. I don't think I'm alone in saying that our parents put both their hands on our heads, whether it was the day of the wedding, whether it was a standard Friday night. Uh, I, you know, I, I remember my father always putting both hands on my head. When I get to spend Shabbos with him now, uh, last time was Hanukkah time when I went to Israel. So I was I, it was such a privilege to get a bracha from my father on Friday night. Again, he put both hands on my head. And that's what everybody does outside of the grunt in his circle. So how come they're not worried about this? So he says, They put both their hands on people's heads. He goes, I know everybody else is not mocked, but nobody else is worried about this. But I just wanted to put this out there that people should know um, what, what did the Vilna go and do? He says, I mentioned this also in Torah Tamima somewhere, but I wanted to just put it here. So again, he's not saying everybody else should stop what they're doing. Everyone else is valid. Everyone else is fine. Because we're not really mimicking the Kohanim. Mimicking the Kohanim would be to raise your hands and shul, split your fingers, and now recite, recite Berchas Kohanim. That's not what parents are doing when they bench their kids on Friday night. That's not what they're doing when they bless their kids before their weddings. They're putting their hands on their heads and they're saying brachas. So that's what everybody else would say. What did the Vilna Gon say? The Vilna Gon said, even that, he was worried was a little bit too much like the Kohanim. Fascinating. So if you ever see, if you're in a circle and you ever see somebody bless their kids just putting one hand on their head and not two, so now you know, okay, they're following the custom of the Vilna Gon. They're not off the rocker and, and that's what they're doing. They're following the custom of the Vilna Gon. So it's just something to be aware of if you ever see that happening. All right, fascinating. Let's see the third source. This third source I found tremendously interesting. The third source is as follows, also going on Berchas Kohanim. We know that when the Kohanim um, are blessing us and it's Yom Tov, so they're singing after each Pasuk, and then they'll sing a tune. Uh, during that time, we say a special Yehi Ratzon. So that's what he's going to be talking about. The Talmud Brachos, the Gemara Meseches Brachos says, if someone has a dream, they see a dream, a very clear dream, they don't know what to make of it. They don't know what to make of this dream and what's it getting at. They should go before the Kohanim at the time that they're spreading out their hands, meaning in parentheses, when they're going to bless everyone, that's the time that to go in front of the Kohanim and they should recite the following idea. Uh, God Almighty, I am yours. I had a dream and I don't know what to make of it. Uh, and, and we know the, the, the text. It's in our Siddur. It's in our Machzer. Whenever we're at Berchas Kohanim and it's on Yom Tov and the Kohanim are singing their tune, there's a special Yeratz we say. He says, next paragraph, this kadmonim, this really only makes sense according to the original custom in Israel, which is still the case in Israel. In Israel, the Kohanim, in most places in Israel, the Kohanim, Duchen, they get up to bless everyone every single day. And if there's a Musaf, they'll do it twice. If someone had a dream the night before, wants to daven God, say, I don't know what that dream was, but please let it be good. Go to show when the Kohanim are up there blessing everyone, say that special tefillah about chalom chalamti. I had a dream, I don't know what to make of it. Please let it be good. Mishalo chalom lo. And if someone did not have a bad dream disturbing them, lo alach. He doesn't have to go. And if he isn't sure, he doesn't say that prayer. That's what the Gemara seemingly applies that this, this prayer is meant for someone who had a disturbing dream. They don't know what to make of it. So make sure to be there at the time of Berkas Kohanim and make sure to say that prayer. If you didn't have a bad dream, there's no reason to say that prayer. But nowadays, us living in Galus in Chutz Laretz, that the Kohanim only bless us on Yom Tov, and between, let's say the last time was Pesach, we just had Shavuos, but then the next time's not going to be till Rosh Hashanah. So you've got a lot of time that could pass between now and then. It's not just a person who had a bad dream or a disturbing dream the night before who's got to show up in shul and needs to say that Yiratzon. Everybody needs to be there and everybody needs to say the Yiratzon. 
because we need a daven about all the weird dreams we've had from the last Yom Tov to now, because in Israel where it's every day, so I can understand, okay, that's a prayer they got to say, only if they had a bad dream the night before. But in Chutz Laaretz, where they're not saying it since last Yom Tov, we've all had weird dreams, so we all need to say this uh, by the time next Yom Tov rolls around. Even though I have no memory at all about those dreams, I still got to say this. So he says, Vios Cain, if that's the case, he says it would make a lot more sense if we make a slight tweak in the nusach and the text of the prayer that we recite. Instead of saying, I had a dream and I don't know what to make of it, which seems to imply I'm talking about what I dreamt about last night before the quantum or blessing, like I explained. What I should say instead is, in the plural, I had many dreams of any Odea Mahem, and I don't know what to make of them. Plomar, in any Odea, I don't I don't know, or Zohar, I don't remember. I don't even remember what I dreamt about, but in the amount of time that's passed between Yom Tov to Yom Tov, therefore I want them all to be for good. So he says, I think for Jews living in Chutz Laaretz, we really need to amend the text of that Yehiratzon. Instead of Chalom Chalamti, it should be Chalomos Chalamti. And I don't know, instead of mahu, it should be mahem. There is everywhere where it's lashon yachid, where it's written, written in singular, he says it makes a lot more sense for it to be written in plural, because again, it's many weeks and sometimes months have passed since, since the last time I was at Educhening, where the Kohanim were blessing me. So there's certainly more than one dream that I need some help with. That's what he's suggesting here. Now he ends by saying, I spelled this out also in another one of my works, Makor Baruch. But because I think it's important for everybody to be aware of this as it comes up several times a year, I'm writing it again because not everyone has read my Makor Baruch. That's what he points out there. Makes a lot of sense. I'm not aware of any, uh, any Sidurim that made this change. But again, it's not like we're changing something going back to the Anshe Knesset Agdola. This Yehiratzon that we have is going back to the times of the Gemara. And he's saying it's very clear from that Yehiratzon that it was written for if someone had a bad dream. So, okay, so make sure to be in Shul the next day that there's Dochening and say this Yehiratzon. Let's talk about that dream. But for us in Chutzlar, it's that we're not having uh, Dochening for many months. The most sense it makes is to make everything Malash and Rabin, put everything in plural, and that way it'll cover everything that went on between the last Birch Kohanim to now. Makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure uh, that I've seen anyone do this, but it makes a lot of sense. And uh, if anyone wants to do this, you certainly have who to depend upon. And, and again, very, very logical. I want to share one more piece, and this is fascinating. This relates to something that I saw earlier in the year. I believe it was Parshas Vayera that I stumbled upon this. But here he says, uh, he, the uh, the, the Tosefes Bracha, Rabbi Baruch HaLevi Epstein, throws something in tangentially here. He says, V'derech Agav, now that we're on this topic, on the Nusach HaTfila, he, about this, about this, um, uh, about the Nusach that needs to be recited, he says, I, I have uh, something something to say. And what is it? What does he want to share? He says, I lost the place. Give me one second. So he says, Look at what else is in there. It says, He says, And if I need uh, to be healed, please heal me like Chizkiyo. And who was he? He was the Melech Yehuda. And also heal it like the bitter waters that Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe our teacher, healed. So now he says, in a riff rush, when the riff and the rush, those great halachic sources you'll find in the back of the Gemara, when they uh, bring this down, uh, they did something. When they bring this down, uh, which is, again, part of the Nusach of what we have in our Siddur and our Machser, they left out the honorific titles. They don't have it as Chizkiyo Melch It just says Chizkiyo. And when it says Moshe Rabbeinu, they left out Rabbeinu, they just have Moshe. The Kashalomar Kirak Mikra Nishmatu, it's bizarre to say that they just left this out oh, for the heck of it. They left out those honorifics. They obviously left them out for a reason. 
I have not seen anybody point this out. And that to me is astonishing. Why did they change? Why did they delete uh, some words of the text that the Gemara put there? The Gemara gave an honorific title, listed an honorific title for Chizkiyo, called the Melch Yehuda, gave an honorific title for Moshe, called him Rabbeinu. Why did it leave it out? So he says as follows, It seems to be based on the Gemara and Kedushin. It says, Ki Uriah, Sar Shel David. Uriah was one of the officers in David Amalek's army. Nanash, he was punished. Al Shamar Bifnei David. What did he say in front of David? Adoni Yoa. When he was talking about his general, his superior commander, he said, Adoni, my master Yoa. Mipnei, why was he punished? Ki Lola Kavod, who Likro Bifnei Amalek, Tor Adnus Ali Shacher. If he's standing in front of David Amalek, who's the king, it's disrespectful of David to apply the title of Adoni, my master, to somebody else. Standing before the king, who's the master? The highest ranking officer in the room, which is David Amal. So it's disrespectful. It's, it's, uh, it's almost insubordination to David to use a term of, of prestige or honor for another person when David's here. That's what the Gemara says. So he says, Vinemi if that's the case when it comes to David, so then certainly Hashem, if someone's davening in prayer before God, Adam. So then certainly, if he can't in front of David call a human being Adoni, so then certainly in front of the king of all kings, in front of God Almighty, we can't use the term Melech when talking about Chizkiyo, and we can't use the term Rabbeinu, our teacher, our master, when talking about Moshe. And that's his theory. That's his theory why the Rif and the Rush left those terms out. He says, when we're talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if, if we don't use uh, terms of of ranking, terms of master, terms of adnus, when we're talking to Hashem, that's chutzpah. Hashem's our master. Hashem's our, the highest ranking person that we're in communication with. In front of him to call somebody else Adoni or a Melech or a Rabbeinu, that's disrespectful. Uh, you should know, he goes on to say here that that um, uh, that this would also apply when we say a Kel Malay. We shouldn't use honorific terms. We shouldn't say Rabbi if we're talking about a rabbi. We shouldn't say Avi Adoni, my master. We shouldn't do do anything like that. Uh, that that's fascinating. And that would also apply in like a Mishaberach for a Chola. I, I've seen this before. Like someone who's a, a great rabbi, when they ask the community to daven for him, they don't say Harav Agon, you know, Ploni Ben Ploni. They just say Ploni Ben Plonis. For example, there was all these Tilim requests that were going around the last couple of days for Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky. And what it said was Davin for, I believe his name was Shmuel ben Ita Etel. And that's what it says there. Or was it Etel Ita? It was definitely the, the two names together. I don't remember necessarily the order. But it didn't say Harav, Hagon. It didn't do that. And it's from this idea. So uh, I saw this in Parshish Vayera. I saw this come up and, and I, I was a little taken aback. I don't think I had seen it before. And especially if someone's ever davening for a mishabera, for a chola, for a parent, it comes as second nature to say, Avi Adoni, Imi Marasi, my, my teacher, my mother. So it, it just, uh, it, it, to me, I, I, I was really taken aback by that. And I was in touch with some postcom. They say, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. But anyhow, that's what um, Rav Baruch Alevi Epstein gets at from here too. So just to share, we saw a recap. I mean, we saw a couple of very nice ideas about Berchas Kohanim. The first was about the bracha itself. Uh, the Kohanim make, that they emphasize the reason we're sanctified is through our own, not that God directly sanctified them with this mitzvah, because how could they say that with certainty after all these years in exiles and the loss of records, that they're 100% we know they're a Kohen? Okay, we assume they're a Kohen, because that's what their father told them, but they, maybe that's why the, the Lashon, the expression of bracha is different. Then we saw a source that said uh, about the Vilna Gohan had this practice that when he would bless anybody, he only used one hand because in his mind, he was worried that by using two hands, he might infringe upon what was the responsibilities of the Kohanim, and he didn't want to do that. Everybody else seems to argue and says, no, you're only infringing on what the Kohanims do. The Kohanim are supposed to do. If you lift both hands and separate your fingers, and the CS Kapayim, so that's why no one else was worried about that. But if we ever see someone who's mocked on that, they're following the Vilna Gon. The third thing that we saw was his idea that the text should be amended when we talk about about uh, Halom Halamti. I had a dream, it should be Halomos, because nowadays there's months have gone by between the two Yom Tovim. And the last idea that he saw was, why was it that the Rif and the Rush took out Melech from Chizkiyo and they took out Rabbeinu from Moshe? 
because we're standing before Hashem. If we're standing before Hashem, it's not appropriate to uh, to to call others a king and call others a, a teacher. All right, we're gonna conclude here. I'm going.